Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends welcome to the class of public international law a subject of vital importance especially in today's times where we see plethora of problems around the world it is this subject that helps us give solutions it is this subject which makes states come together make regulations make rules and make law in order to resolve problems of human rights humanitarian matters law of the sea environmental issues trade related aspects maritime matters labor related aspects intellectual property right and what not and it is public international law that helps us maintain peace and order bring prosperity around the globe it is this subject which helps us to understand the nuances of interstate problems or problems that are beyond states as well so let us go through this journey of the subject where in today's first lecture we will understand the nature and development of international law and we will also understand a bit about one of the most important organization that is united nations organization I am your friend, Dr. Ashutosh Acharya, Senior Assistant Professor from Law Center to University of Delhi, who will be dealing this course in ten modules. The first module that we will discuss today, as I told you, is about the nature and development of international law. If you look at the modules that we will be discussing through this course, we have a list here. wherein after discussing today's lecture we will go through one by one sources of international law wherein we will look at how international law and from where international law grows or international law origins secondly we will look at one of the important sources of international law and that is law of treaties we will understand how treaties are signed how treaties can be a problem in reaching to a solution and most importantly how treaties can be a solution in today's times what are the technicalities that are to be adopted as far as signing and finalization of a treaty is concerned so treaty law is one of the most important source of law in today's time and we will discuss in that module the vienna convention on law of treaties which sets the guideline to discuss the law of treaties we will also discuss in our third module international law and municipal law what is the relationship between international law and municipal law how municipal law changes its facet how municipal law gets constructed by the influence of international international law what is the discourse between international law and municipal law especially with the focus of india will be discussed as far as the fourth module is concerned we will also discuss subjects of international law territory and jurisdiction which is again one of the most important topic in today's time as well as in earlier times as well we will discuss law of the sea an important arena of international law i consider law of the sea to be the cradle of international law as we see international law got developed from law of the sea itself and while we discuss law of the sea we will be justifying that particular aspect as well even in today's lecture we will go through certain instances where we will see how law of the sea has shaped in the growth of public international law because we must note that it was the transportation that allowed interconnection intermingling and 
coming together of different states of different civilizations around the globe. It is through trade through which we see states got to know each other, states reached out to each other. It, is, it was the sea route through which we see that people from one part of the world reached in another part of the world. And this inter-exchange of not only material but also culture and ideas led to development of international law. We will discuss immunities. In today's time, we see immunities of jurisdiction given to ambassadors, counselors, etc. And we will see what is the law pertaining to these immunities. We will also discuss a state responsibility, again an important topic of international law. You see that state responsibility settles down the rules and regulations pertaining to imputation of liability and what remedy to be given. When imputation of liability cannot be endowed upon a particular state and when it can be endowed upon a particular state, when a state can be held responsible, when it will not be held responsible. All of these things will be discussed under state responsibility. And lastly, in the last module, we will discuss use of force and international humanitarian law. Again, a very important and interesting, interactive topic to be discussed, wherein we will see the complexities of use of force, especially in today's time where we see proxy wars, private security forces fighting for states, whether states are actually using force, where individual or unilateral sanctions are imposed, but no military sanction is imposed by one state. Can we say that there is use of force? What does humanitarian law say once force has been used, once aggression has been committed? What is the law pertaining to prisoners of war? What is the law pertaining to the protection of child, women, hospital, educational institution, cultural, arts, etc.? when they are actually not directly involved in the armed conflict situations. What does the law say? So, this is a course which will try to cover almost all the areas surrounding public international law and especially which concerns importantly to the students to understand the basic tenets of public international law. In today's lecture, the learning objectives that we have set down is to understand the relationship between law, politics and the role of force. We will also learn about the origin and basic tenets of international law. We will travel through the growth of international law in time and space. We will look at different times, especially important times where we see that important growth has taken place or this is a landmark growth as far as public international law is concerned. What was the situation at that point of time? We will try and understand that situation as well. We will try to know the different approaches to international law. There are different approaches, especially with respect to the situation where we see that there are economies which favor open economy market or open market system. There are societies or states which favor communist approach and then there are states which became part of third world nation and led to a third approach as far as international law is concerned. So we will look at these three different approaches. Apart from three main different approaches, certain other approaches are also present in today's time that how do you look international law from a feminist point of view is another approach. There may be other approaches to international law, but we will focus on the already discussed approaches as far as the contemporary scenario of international law is concerned. We will also learn about the structure of United Nations and its basic role in contemporary times. Now, before we start, let me ask or let me raise three basic questions. Why international law? What is international law and how international law? Once we answer these three questions, we get the holistic idea of any subject. And for today's subject, if we try to 
answer these three basic questions, we will certainly get the holistic idea of public international law. So, what is international law? I will start from the terminology itself. The name of the course is public international law. What do we mean by the word public? What do we mean by the word international? And what do we mean by the word law? I need not go deep into the understanding and meaning of the word law. But we certainly need to dive into the word international and also try to peripherally understand what is the meaning of the word public. Public is a word which is generally used in the sense or in the scenario where people at large are concerned, where not individual rights are at a stake, but a collective rights are at a stake. So, when it concerns collective rights represented by states, represented by society, represented by civilization, we say that it belongs to public or those rights and duties belong to public. If there is a cultural heritage, it is not an individual property, but a public signification, but a material of public signification. In that scenario, protection of cultural heritage becomes public law or, or falls within the domain of public law. But if there is a breach of contract, certainly it will be a breach of private right. So, we bifurcate the public law and private law and then add international law to it. So, when we understand generally the word public and we add international to it and try to understand what do we mean by the word international, then we will, we can bifurcate the word international and see that the word international comes from two words and that is inter and national. Inter means between and national means between two states. The word national has been used since a longer period of time for a very particular basic reason. And this basic reason is that the idea of a state and nation existed differently and it is only later on after the European idea of nation state theory comes into being, we see formation of states and the rights and duties of states coming into being. We will not discuss and go into the rights and duties of states per se, but just for the matter of understanding, some authors also use in today's time and has also been used in the 20th century public interstate law. However, we see that this subject covers people of not only belonging to certain state, but also people not falling into any recognized state. And therefore, we see the word international and not largely interstate. It is a law which primarily governs a state as far as their interaction is concerned, as far as their transaction is concerned but not only states, it indirectly also covers individuals as well as organizations. So, therefore, we say and generally use the word public international law and law as I said is used as a, a subject which tries to maintain peace, order and security around the globe. The next question that we have before us is why international law? That is to regulate relationship between different nations. Friends, we see that all the nations or all the states do not have friendly relations with each other. We also see that states have their selfish interest, states have their interests in general also, where their interests are at a stake. States try to force their interests interest against other state or states. In that scenario, when any sort of conflict comes into being, international law tries to resolve that conflict. And let me tell you, that is only one of the reason. The most important reason would be to establish good relationship, to prosper in that relationship. Just like two individuals in domestic legal system 
want to establish legal relationship of contractual obligation through marriage or any other mode, we can say that there, uh, there are certain rights and duties in place. And those legal relationships bound the parties with each other as far as their rights and duties are concerned. Law recognizes their rights and duties mutually agreed upon. Similarly, states also enter into treaties, agreements, sign conventions or without signing treaty also enter into certain memorandum of understanding or they have certain soft laws amongst themselves so that they can grow their legal relationship amongst them. So, why international law? To grow relationship between states, to settle down rights and duties amongst them, to settle down any conflict that may arise between two or more than two states. So, therefore, international law is an essential subject as far as these two basic reasons are concerned. One, to grow and second one, to resolve any conflict that may come into being as far as two or more than two states are concerned. Friends, we must be knowing and you, if, you, if you lead a little history and if you get to know about a history about, a history about uh, European states, Asian states or African states, we get to know that states initially had the idea of expansion. The idea of expansionism was so much prevalent and common amongst the states that it led to war, led to unsettled civilizations and destructions. So, all in all, we saw that there was complete loss of human life, destruction of property and led to stumbling of any growth which may be scientific, cultural or political around the globe. And therefore, it was public international law that led to settlement of conflicts between states. And the, this law helps us to maintain peace and security around the globe. The third question that we have is how international law? International law functions largely through its subjects and we will in the upcoming slides, we will see that what are the different subjects of international law and not only that, we will also have a module which is titled subjects of international law. There in detail, we will study how subjects lead to enforcement, implementation or at least genesis of public international law for whom public international law is made, who are the primary bodies of public international law. The primary body of public international law is no doubt a states and it is the state that lead to execution of international law. The secondary, secondarily, we can say that it is international organization again directly or indirectly through states. It is the international organizations that work as far as the question how international law is concerned, but certainly indirectly as far as individuals are concerned. Friends, in the learning objectives we saw that there is international law, but also I have mentioned that we will look at the actual functioning of international law. It is not as clean as we see as I have been talking so far that international law is a law which settles down conflicts, which helps us to grow each other with each other as far as different states are concerned. It is also combined with a very important subject which is known as politics and it is the politics that cannot be separated from law, especially public international law is concerned. International politics is so complex, sometimes simple, but most of the times complex as far as the making of international law is concerned. If I try to make it simple, let us understand that there are approximately 200 states and these 200 states have 
approximately 2000 interests and that too against each other. How to reconcile those interests? How to settle down those states? How to call upon all these states to sit together and realize and recognize interest of each of these states? This is a complex job. So, it is the politics that leads to stumbling or it acts as a stumbling block or we can say it is the politics that saves the interests of states. It is the politics that creates blocks, collective security, collective interests and then leads to framing, making of international law. So, we cannot segregate law from politics as far as making of international law is concerned. And it is due to this particular factor, many jurists, especially in 19th century, believed that international law is not a true law. International law is a law of fashion. This is a phrase termed or you can say said by John Austin. John Austin is a philosopher who belonged to positivist school of thought or you can say analytical school of thought who drew comparisons between two types of legal systems and law and he considers international law to be a positive morality and the reason that he has given is that there is a lack of sanction mechanism. Now, if you look at John Austin's theory, it is largely based on three pillars and that is command, duty and sanction. If any of these pillars is missing, then we cannot say that that particular law can be categorized as a law. So, if a particular rule order has to be categorized as law or to be coined and termed as positive law, it must come in the form of command. Command is a wish by the sovereign. So, there has to be a sovereign. The other person is bound to follow that particular command and this obligation will be known as duty and in case of breach of that duty, he or she will face sanction. If there is no sanction, if there is no mentioning of coercion or there is absence of coercion, then it cannot be termed as law. However, friends, we have seen that after Austin gave his theory in 19th century, we see that in 20th century especially, international law grew to a tremendous extent. There is a significant rise as far as growth in the public international law is concerned. There has been significant rise in the formation of multiple international organizations. It is the 20th century that saw League of Nations, United Nations organizations, the two main peacekeeping organizations or we see a number of other organizations also coming into being that function in different aspects. For example, World Trade Organization, International Labor Organization, Food and Agricultural Organization as an specialized organization, International Maritime Organization and what not. So, this mushrooming of organization in 20th century is an example to show that how international law has grew in the last century. Therefore, we see that international law as per Austin, it may be a positive morality wherein it is written, but it cannot be implemented with force because there is no binding obligation and even if there is, there is no method of sanction. Whereas in domestic legal system, we see existence of sanction, implementation of sanction. So, therefore, there are other jurists and proponents who believe in what John Austin says, but then there are other class of jurists which believe that international law is not a weak law. But if we try to look at it in today's time, it is certainly hard to conclude that international law is a weak law. Yes, there are problems in the international legal systems with respect to implementation 
and enforcement. However, there are now mechanisms, there are now efforts that have been made to bring in enforcement and make it work in the domestic legal system between the states internationally and get it implemented as much as possible. So, with this question, we also see, we also need to see that what is the basis of international law. If you look at international system, international legal system can be found or is found on the basis of consent. It is found or it is based on pacta sunt savanda, that is pacts must be agreed, that, that is pacts must be followed. It is also based on legislature, judiciary and executive. I will explain what do we understand when we talk about these three pillars and certainly reciprocity. Any international agreement or apart from international agreement, if international law is formed, it is formed on the basis of consent. A state is not bound by a law which is international in nature or it is part of international legal system to which a state is bound if it has not consented to only in exceptional scenarios which are peremptory norms of international law or use cogens. Apart from that, most of the international law largely is based on consent. A state will accept obligation only if it has consented to it. If a state has not consented to a certain obligation, it will not be bound by it. So, it is largely, largely based on consent, only except in certain scenarios. The second basis is pacta sunt servanda, which means that is pacts must be followed. It is the moral legitimate legal basis for any treaty law that is signed by a state. Once you sign a treaty, you are bound by it. When I say you, it means the state that signs the treaty will be bound by it and this is based on this particular principle. It is also based on legislative body. What is the legislative body? Largely, it is the states that are the legislative body. We have International Law Commission that formulates drafts to be signed between the states and that will ultimately result into conventions. Then executive body, different organizations have their own exec mechanism for execution. If you look at United Nations organization, it has Security Council which is an executive body. Then another basis is the judicial body. WTO has a dispute settlement body, United Nations Organization has International Court of Justice for criminal matters, we have ICC and then other international tribunals as well. So, there are not much, there is not much availability of judicial bodies as far as international system is concerned, as far as adjudication is concerned. However, there are certain important bodies that have come into being in the last 100 to 120 years. Apart from that, we also see that international law is based on reciprocity, which is give and take. If a state allows certain concessions to another state, then another state as a sign of goodwill will also reciprocate in the same manner. Let us say for example, in today's time, if a state A allows citizens of a state B visa free, perhaps a state B can also allow or will also allow citizens of a state A into a state B visa free. So, that is reciprocity, which is largely seen in the matters of diplomacy, abiding to international agreements and past practices. We also see friends an important role being played by force, where we see that since there is absence of unified system of sanction, we can say that force has played a significant role as far as collectivism is concerned, coming together of states is concerned, 
oppression of states are concerned and they, all of this leads to formation of international law and again as i said previously that politics and law cannot be separated so therefore force is a tool of political uh, aspect so force can be used by political uh, segment as a tool in order to lead to formation of international law political agendas can be sufficed with by using force as a tool in the making of international law there are matters pertaining to threat to peace breach of peace or act of aggression that acts as force we will discuss this particular aspect in the last module also in detail but just for the matter of introduction we can say that all of these aspects also play a great role as far as formation and making of international law is concerned or you can say development of international law is concerned apart from that you have economic sanctions military sanctions and self help which means self defense or idea of self defense next we look at the historical development of international law wherein if you look at early origins we can trace the international law since the times of mesopotamia where we can look at certain evidences one of the example or evidence would be border treaty signed between rulers of lagash and aba inscribed on stone block since there was absence of paper and pen at that point of time and therefore these stone blocks show that how two states used to enter into treaty secondly we see rameses second of egypt and the king of hittites for establishment of eternal peace and brotherhood we also see international law coming into being as far as hindu chinese and greek societies are concerned about world peace tolerance and humanity and especially if you look at trade we know that the traders or merchants from india or indian subcontinent used to travel to europe or africa merchants somehow used to reach to india or indian subcontinent or china so this interaction also shows how international law existed in early times as well if you look at roman empire we trace two types of legal systems that is use civil and use gentium wherein use civil is the law which is used or which will be, which was used for the roman citizens and use gentium for foreigners so there was a recognition of foreign individuals and existence of international transaction at the same time if you move forward we have middle ages and renaissance times wherein the important aspect can be traced from lex mercatoria that is law of the merchant as i said law of the sea and maritime law has played a significant role as far as development of international law is concerned we can trace back the story of merchant of venice it was the port where people from all around the world used to come in order to trade it was the developed port of the european continent or subcontinent in the mediterranean sea where we can see that different merchants from all around the globe used to come they used to have different laws at that point of time we don't see much interference of a state but still or you can say yet we can say that there was interaction of people from different states or different civilizations if we consider that states were not as much in existence so looking at this particular aspect that is of law of merchants we also see that there was existence of arbitration mediation conciliation if there is a dispute between two merchants if there is a dispute between a seller and a buyer then this re- this dispute resolution mechanism between two people belonging to two different states two different civilizations can be witnessed then in the middle ages we also see that there was growing supremacy of a state coming into existence of a state identification of boundaries identification of people belonging to a particular nation belonging to a particular state so with this we also can trace that especially if you look at uh, europe we can see that after treaty of westphalia it was agreed 
that European states will not commit the crime of aggression or act of aggression or you can say will not adopt the expansionism as a matter of policy and restrict to their boundaries. So, this we can say is a point where starting of formation of an identified boundary comes into being. And if you look at Europe, we also see that the identity of a particular person belonging to a particular soil gets converted into the identity of the state. So, this particular idea though can be seen in Europe, but not necessarily ca can be seen in other parts of the world. Because if you look at India, we can see that there are multiple ethnic groups, but still coming together forming one single identity, which is again uh, an example in itself. Further, if you look at maritime law, we also see that there was requirement to have rules not only representing national interest of one single state, but cater to the needs of other states as well. This led to the development of the idea of mare liberum. What is mare liberum? Mare liberum, mare means sea, liberum means liberty. So, freedom of seas or you can say liberty with respect to seas. That is, the ships belonging to or traders, merchants belonging to any state do not come within the domain or should not fall within the domain of any particular coastal state. Rather, they must be allowed to trade and interact with the traders of other states. Okay. So, this liberty to trade amongst each other, across boundaries, inter boundaries, through sea route led to also development of international law, especially modern international law. If you see especially the law of the sea and maritime law, these ideas form the basis of conclusion of conventions and treaties as far as treaty law in contemporary times is concerned. We also see friends, development of positivism has played a significant role as far as noting down of international law is concerned. We see treaties coming into being, we see conventions coming into being, multiple agreements coming into being. All of this is contributed by the idea of positivism that law should be clearly written and the duties and obligations and rights must be clearly mentioned as far as states in their interaction are concerned. We see that Grotius, a jurist, led to the contribution as far as development of international law is concerned in Middle Ages and post Renaissance, that is he wrote a book known as De Jure Belli et Pakis, which means it is a book on the law of war and peace, which notes down what should be the rules and regulations that must be adopted and followed as far as war is concerned. It was accepted and believed that war is inevitable, states would go to war. However, what they can do to minimize the destruction of life and property is concerned is that they follow certain rules and how they can maintain peace or they can reach to peace. Then we have 19th century expansion and growth of international law. We see European influence over the world as I have just explained the idea of nation state getting expanded not only in Asia, but also in Africa. Then we see the development of law of war, neutrality and dispute resolution through arbitration. The example of which can be seen in 1872 in Alabama Claims Award, where we see that ship belonging to United Kingdom sailing through Albanian waters was damaged due to the mines that were placed in the waters of Albania. And as a result, we see that UK ships got damaged and then arbitration happened between UK and Alabama for which it was concluded development in the law of war, neutrality and dispute resolution through arbitration. So, we see that in middle ages as the law pertaining to warfare is concerned got also developed that is how prisoners of war should be treated what should be the treatment of child in war, what weapons should be used as far as war is concerned and other rules. We also see principle of neutrality coming into being. There were states 
that accepted the position of being neutral. Recently, we saw that Finland joined NATO forces or you can say NATO, which maintained neutrality since a longer period of time. That is, it will not take sides and once it decides that it will not take sides or any other state that decides that it will be neutral, so it is a land for that matter in second world war, then that particular state must not be harmed or that particular state must not be the target of aggression. Dispute resolution also grew with the passage of time. We see more inclination towards settlement of dispute rather than going for adjudication before international courts. And that is why this is again a type of criticism that states will commit a wrongful act and then they will settle, they will not face the wrath of justice. Well, friends, this is one of the approach, not necessarily that it will be the universal approach. Also, we can say that need not copy the le domestic legal system in order to construct international legal system. And therefore, we see 20th century developments. The most important development that took place is post First World War. And what happened after First World War? And it was in 1919 that a peace treaty was signed and which led to formation or establishment of League of Nations. However, it could not succeed due to certain reasons wherein certain states commit the act of aggression against other states. There were certain very strict rules as far as membership of League of Nations is concerned. States could be ousted, states could not become member of League of Nations and as, an, as a result we see that many states could not become part of League of Nations. Many states especially in Asia and Africa were colonized and therefore they could also not become part of League of Nations. So due to certain essential reasons we see that it could not survive for a longer period of time. In 1921, we see as an initiation or as a part of League of Nations, the establishment of Permanent Court of International Justice, which led to certain very important decisions such as Chorzo Factory case, SS Lotus case, SS Wimbledon case, etc. If you look at Lotus case, it is one of the celebrated as well as criticized case. Again, it belongs to a matter pertaining to law of the sea, wherein we see that a ship called SS Lotus was sailing through Turkish waters and in that Turkish water it collided with a ship named Buzkat leading to destruction of the ship and death of certain crew members of the SS Buzkat. The captain of SS Lotus was then captured by Turkish authorities, put before prosecution or was prosecuted before the Turkish court. France raised objection to the jurisdiction of the trial of French captain. The matter was then referred to Permanent Court of International Justice by France and Turkey whether Turkey will have jurisdiction. Though the court gave the decision in favor of Turkey that yes, it will have jurisdiction. However, later on it was criticized that the court could or should have an objective approach as far as identification of jurisdiction is concerned. Nevertheless, we get to learn the jurisprudence about jurisdiction. We get to understand the detailing of jurisdiction that whether the states can have jurisdiction in such matters, whether flag state jurisdiction will prevail or coastal state jurisdiction will prevail, ultimately led to the growth of international law. Similarly, we see first international organization coming into being as an effort of coming together of a states at League of Nations and that was establishment of International Labour Organization in 1919. It is considered to be one of the first international organizations 
modern international organizations. It is still in existence today and it has contributed to the society at not only international but as also at national level in formulating rules pertaining to labor and industrialist aspects. Not the last and the least and the most important organization that we have in present times is United Nations organization, which is still functioning and working in multiple arenas but the most important area for which or field for which it was agreed into was maintenance of peace and security. International maintenance of peace and security is the primary objective of this organization. We will discuss the structure and understand the structure also in the last slide of today's lecture. So, we see coming into being of United Nations organization and then the indirect or direct objective of United Nations organization being the establishment of idea of equality and right to self-determination. We see that after the establishment of United Nations organization, the idea of equality around the globe was being propagated. People around the globe were made aware of their right to self-determination and recognition of their human rights. It is the objective directly or indirectly of United Nations organization by maintaining peace and security to establish human rights around the globe in different states. It was through the recognition of right to self-determination that we see that the states got decolonized. Ethnic groups getting recognized by their own self-rule, fighting for their identity, getting recognized their identity is the realization of right to self-determination. So, we see that post-establishment of UNO, the states started getting decolonized. India being one of the first country getting decolonized in 1947, in, till 1960s we see number of other Asian and African countries getting decolonized. The process continued till 1990s also we see it indirectly though sometimes directly. However, the most important part is that the idea of colonization was to end and this led to individual states coming into picture and asserting its own interest rather than being subjugated to the interests and objectives of some other state. And therefore, the second half of the 20th century that is post decolonization era saw growth into the development of international law. There have been different approaches to international law and it was the second half of the 20th century wherein we see that these different approaches got to or came to struggle with each other as far as international law is concerned. It is not that prior to 1945 there was no struggle towards the different approaches to international law, but yes, some amount of consensus was coming into ground or onto ground. However, there were certain powerful states which led to Cold War era. We witnessed Cold War era largely because of these difference in approaches. And these approaches can be identified as capitalist approach, communist approach and then third world approach. The proponent of capitalist approach being the America and European states wanted the world to have a certain type of legal structure and legal system. Whereas, USSR, China and certain other countries wanted to have a different type of international legal structure and international legal system. Difference in ideologies led to difference in formation of international legal system. Most of the times 
it used to act as a stumbling block as far as conclusion of international law is concerned. However, somehow with the passage of time, we see some compromise being reached by these states in order to formulate the today's international legal system. The friction between these two states, these two different blocks certainly led to halting the growth of international law, but at the same time communist approach as well as third world approach has led to realization of interests that were catered and propagated by certain other states such as states that just got decolonized, states that were still searching for space in the international arena, states that had been looted due to colonization or as a result of colonization, wanted their rights to be recognized, to be realized in the modern international legal system. They wanted to bargain, they wanted to negotiate as far as their rights are concerned, as far as their economic interests are concerned, as far as their representation at the international forum is concerned. And therefore, if you look at communist approach to international law, it tried to deconstruct and reconstruct the idea of right, capitalist centric idea of international law, as it is claimed that the current system creates east, west and north, south divide. It is also said that there must be reorganization of resources. The resources around the globe are unevenly distributed and therefore, the terms of settlement, the conditions of signing the agreement must be equal because there is already an inequality in place that exists because of the influence of the states that believe in the capitalism or a certain particular ideology. Therefore, there is a need to give preference, there is a need to give concession, there is a need to reorganize the whole international system, the whole international legal structure, so that the developing, least developed countries, countries can also benefit from the international legal system. The third world struggled to gain equitable share in international organizations and other concessions in the making of international system. The third world approach largely led by India, you can say, it was these countries who were just colon decolonized, who just came out of the wrath of colonization since they were under subjugation for 100 or more than 100 years sometimes. They wanted to have a system that favors them, that is not unfavorable to them since they are already in a disadvantageous position and the progressive states or the progressed states or the states that are having more resources are in advantageous position. So therefore, there was a need to reach to a balancing equitable position. That is why third world approach was necessary to understand international law from a certain point of view. If you look at the definition of international law as far as the growth is concerned, apart from these approaches of international law, different approaches of international law and then formation of international law in today's time, how international law was seen earlier by European states. So, the definition that we will discuss here exemplifies and shows us that how international law was in existence as far as these underdeveloped or least developed countries were concerned. So, I will just mention here a definition that was given by Oppenheim. He says in his old definition, law of nations or international law is the, say, is the name for the body of customary and conventional rules which are considered legally binding by civilized states in their intercourse with each other. Friends, there are certain problems as far as 
this particular definition is concerned. However, later on it was rectified in the new definition, but it is necessary to understand how other states which includes Africa and Asia largely were viewed and, un, and, and, and perceived as far as European countries are concerned. So, if you see the definition as it says law of nations or international law is the name for the body of customary and conventional rules. So, firstly it includes customary and conventional rules which will include treaties as well and conventions which are considered legally binding. So, they here in this definition Oppenheim does not uh, believe that the customary rules and treaties are legally binding, but are considered to be legally binding. But more and most importantly what I want to point out, point out here is it says by civilized states. So, international law was not in existence for all the states, but for certain states and those certain states are civilized states and when they enter into intercourse with each other only then international law is followed. However, it got rectified in the 20th century, especially in 1991, we see inter international law is the body of rules which are legally binding on states in their intercourse with each other. These rules are primarily those which govern the relation of states, but states are not the only subjects of international law, international organizations and to some extent also individuals may be subjects of rights conferred and duties imposed by international law. So, it got improvised, it included sub other subjects of international law, it got rid of the word civilized states and therefore, we see a new definition coming into being. And lastly, United Nations at a glance as I said that it is one of the most important organization and it has de helped and contributed in developing the public international law and forming the behavior of international law that how international law will behave and what will be the nature of international law. So, currently there are 193 members, it is situated in Manhattan, New York. The purpose as I already told you is to maintain international peace and security and how it does that it is by keep by sending United Nations peacekeeping forces as you can see in different areas around the globe. Wherever there is a turmoil, there is war like situation, armed conflict situation in order to protect civilians, in order to protect certain properties which are of cultural heritage significance, which are hospitals etcetera. So, the, protect, the, the protected property and individuals gets protected by United Nations peacekeeping forces. It is sent by United Nations organization and by this it fulfills one of its essential purpose. Another purpose is to develop friendly relations among nations, then to achieve international cooperation in various fields such as human rights, warfare, economic matters, cultural matters and fundamental freedoms. The structure of United Nation is that it has six important organs and they are General Assembly, Security Council, Secretary, Economic and Social Council, International Court of Justice which is judicial body of United Nation and then Trusteeship Council which is largely non-functional in today's time. General Assembly can be considered to be Parliament of the United Nation, Security Council is the main executive body of the United Nation and with this it forms a holistic structure as far as uh, this organization is concerned. It has certain specialized agencies which works in specialized areas such as FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, IMO, International Maritime Organization, IMF, Monetary Fund, WHO, Health Organization, functioning in different specific areas. By this it also helps in maintaining and upkeeping the idea of humanity and maintaining peace and security. With this friends, I would say thank you so much for your patient listening. Namaskar.